Everybody Edits is a multiplayer sandbox game by Chris Benjaminson. The game gives players a few tools to work with, which can be used to create all kinds of levels for others to play. In an environment like this, it didn't take long for difficult worlds to start appearing in the lobby, and as players beat the most challenging levels, the skill ceiling was nudged higher and higher. The question is, how high does it go? Our story begins in early 2010. Shortly after the release of Everybody Edits, users from many online communities came to check out the game. Reddit users, Newgrounds users, and 4chan users all came together to create challenges for other players to beat. Simple minigames would be created to challenge the players, but none of them truly utilized the mechanics of the game to its full potential. Everybody Edits was vastly different from many of the other popular 2D platformers at the time. In other platformers, most of the difficulty came from dodging hazards and performing pinpoint jumps. Since everybody edits did not have any hazards at this point, precise jumps would have to suffice. But the game offered so much more than just jumping from block to block. With icy physics and arrows that could change the direction of gravity, builders could utilize momentum to create challenges unlike those found in any other 2D platformer. All it would take is one player to realize this, to revolutionize minigame creation forever. In May of 2010, a user called MFL created the Mindfuck level series and pushed the boundaries of Everybody Edits physics. Each level featured a series of minigames that required the player to have a deep understanding of how the physics of the game operated. Many of these minigames may seem trivial now, but back then, no one really had a solid grasp of the physics of the game. No one but MFL. MFL continued the series up to Mindfuck levels 9, challenging players with innovative minigames. Unfortunately, in the early days of Everybody Edits, levels could not be saved, so all we have to remember them by are a few old screenshots taken by MFL himself. A few months later, MFL was given a tool to save levels to his computer. Now he could take his time and construct a level more challenging than all the ones before it. On July 30th, 2010, MFL released Mindfuck Levels 10. When it was released, it very well may have been one of the hardest levels in the game because it forced players to play in a way that they weren't used to. At the time, most levels had platforming that looked like this, because it was both easy to make and understand. All you have to do is jump from block to block. But MFL's minigames looked like this. They required momentum. They forced the player to use arrows in strange new ways to reach the end. And it all culminates here, the final challenge. It has tight platforming, precise arrow paths, and a jump at the end that was so difficult that it had its own name, the MFL Special 2. Not many people beat this level at the time of its release, but MFL's levels laid the groundwork for how challenging minigames would look for years to come. This may only be the start of our story, but it lets us understand just how far ahead of their time the Mindfuck levels were. After Mindfuck Levels 10 was released, a new project was teased on the forums. The level was designed by a small group of builders, and it set out to be the new hardest level in Everybody Edits. Attached to the teaser was a single image, warning players of what was to come, and a few days later it was released to the public. This is X-Pro Rainbow Road Rage. X-Crew had dominated the game with their X-Crew brand of levels, but this level was a change of pace for how they created their maps. Compared to their other worlds, the art and gameplay seemed far less intertwined, and the minigames were just scattered across the level in rainbow boxes. But that didn't really matter because the focus was on the minigames. Rainbow Road Rage was a test of skill, 16 trials for the player to complete, each more difficult than the last, and only after beating them all would they be crowned the king of Rainbow Road Rage. To figure out what made this level so hard, let's take a look at one of its hardest minigames, Minigame 13. The player starts here and has to loop around to get the coin. In order to do this though, they have to precisely aim through each of these holes. This may seem easy at first, after all, these gaps are double the size of the smiley, but here's the problem. Everybody edits... is fast. 
The player has very little time to react to their positioning to adjust themselves, and has to be thinking one step ahead at all times. Pair this with complex arrow key combinations, and you have a recipe for a minigame that stumped even the most skilled players at the time. For a few months, Rainbow Road Rage was the only level under the X-Pro brand. They released other maps in the meantime, but none of them came anywhere close in difficulty. Finally, two months after Rainbow Road Rage, they released their second X-Pro map, X-Pro Are You A God? With the release of this map, X-Crew solidified what would be known as the X-Pro style. Maps of this style would have a few key features. The level would have to be approximately 16 challenges in total, each challenge would feature a distinct concept, challenges would be done in a single movement, and finally, the last few minigames had to be extremely difficult. When we look at this level, we can see some similarities to Rainbow Road Rage. The level lulls unsuspecting players in with a few simple challenges so they start sinking time into the level. Then, suddenly, the difficulty spikes. The player is too far into it to go back now, so they continue onwards, but as the level gets harder and harder, the player has to either throw in the towel or prove themselves to be one of the best. Each of the minigames in Are You A God are challenging in their own right, but there is one that stood out, one harder than all the previous minigames combined. Just mentioning it would give players flashbacks to the hours that they spent trying to complete it. This is minigame 15. Looking at it, you might be wondering what makes this minigame so difficult. After all, the minigames before it feature intricate combinations of gravity changes, but this one is just 5 jumps. Let's look at each jump individually. Every block has a ceiling above it, and without momentum, the player will bonk and lose their height. This means the minigame must be done in a single motion, but here's the catch. If you jump full speed, you'll miss. Between each jump, you have to find a way to slow yourself down just enough to land on the platform while maintaining the speed to not bonk the ceiling. This concept would later be known as speed control, and it was revolutionary. This simple combination of blocks began to hold power. Builders began to put it in their own levels, and players would instantly know the challenge that awaits them. At the time of the release of Are You A God, this minigame was likely the hardest challenge in all of Everybody Edits. The question is, who would be the first to beat it? This is Daniel1234. Daniel was perhaps the first pro of Everybody Edits. Back in 2010, if you asked any member of the community who the most skilled players were, it was more than likely that Daniel's name would come up, and for good reason. For levels that stumped the average player, he would fly through with ease. He truly had control over the physics of the game, and could easily perform the inputs needed to get past whatever obstacle stood in his way. X-Pro Are You A God was the ultimate test for Daniel. It was by no means easy, but he persevered. After hours of grinding, hundreds of attempts, missed jumps, and missed inputs, he finally completed the level, and his name was written in gold at the top of the win list, preserved in history forever, as a reminder of how far ahead Daniel was compared to the other players. After the release of Are You A God, X-Crew began putting more time into making their levels. Instead of spending a few weeks on each individual project, worlds would take months or even years. They wanted to ensure maximum quality was put into every level that they put out, and levels from that period are still regarded as some of the best levels in Everybody Edits history. So they began work on a new X-Pro project, codenamed The Gauntlet, and started crafting minigames harder than any that came before. They made a bunch of minigames with varying concepts and difficulty, and selected the best 16 to be featured in the level. Finally, after being in development for a year and a half, the level was released to the public, X-Pro Forgotten Veil. Vale. This level was a bit different than the last few. By this time, X-Crew had gained quite the reputation in Everybody Edits, and every time a new level came out, hordes of players raced to beat it. 
the best players from Everybody Edits would compete to be the first on the win list. On April 14th, 2012, the level was released to the public and the floodgates were opened. As the players got further in the level, the minigames became more brutal, and after a few hours, the top players hit their first wall, minigame 13. This minigame is pretty simple to understand. Just hold right and time 4 jumps, alternating between holding down and up. The problem, however, is the speed. These are portals, and when the player fails the minigame, they enter a chain of them. If you look closely at them though, you can see that they all have a small white arrow on them that go in various directions. In Everybody Edits, if you enter a portal that's facing one way, then exit through a portal facing somewhere else, your speed increases by 42%. So if you chain a bunch of these together, you gain speed fast. Additionally, the player's camera is teleporting all over the place, so they pretty much have to guess when they need to jump. But after nearly 6 hours, one of the top players moved on, edging closer to the end of the level. But it wouldn't take long for them to hit their next wall. A wall that was likely the new hardest minigame in all of everybody edits. Minigame 15. Earlier in the video, I mentioned speed control. Even after practicing it in Are You A God, it still proved very difficult for many of the top players. Performing it is awkward. Usually the player has to just barely lift their finger off the key they're holding. If they do it for too long, they'll completely miss the next platform, but if they don't do it for long enough, they'll hit the ceiling. But this was the hardest level in the game, so why not make the players suffer? This minigame is symmetrical, and can be done from both sides. The player has to start from one of these platforms, performing speed control to get to the other with enough momentum to not hit this ceiling. Then the hard part. The player has to get from here to this block, but the turnaround is incredibly tight. Overshooting would land them in these arrows, and undershooting makes them miss the block entirely. Then, one more speed control, and a leap of faith to the end of the minigame. This minigame stumped the top players for hours, and for good reason. Even the creators of the minigame hadn't actually beaten it. They knew it was possible, having tested each individual segment, but no one had strung it together in a successful attempt. But it was possible and after being stuck for nearly 6 hours, the top players started to break through. They each beat the final minigame, and their names were added to the winners list. These players were at the top, with their names being on the most prestigious win list at the time. Remember Orange Crix and Master 1, they'll be coming up later. But we're forgetting someone though, aren't we? Ah, there he is. Forgotten Veil vale marked the final level in the X-Pro trilogy. For years after its release, no map quite matched the difficulty found in Forgotten Veil. Vale. Many tried to mimic the X-Pro style, but as far as difficulty goes, Forgotten Veil vale remained on top. In 2013, a new type of block was added to the game, the spike. When you touch it, you're sent back to the last checkpoint you touched. A few spike levels started to pop up in 2013 and 2014, and some were pretty difficult but none were really as hard as Forgotten Veil. Vale. That being said, it can get pretty complicated to compare the difficulties for these kinds of levels. For X-Pro levels, the player had to do one long, fluid movement filled with difficult inputs. These can often be pretty awkward and require the player to memorize strange combinations of inputs to beat. On the other hand, Spike minigames typically relied on platforming. There were no long chains of inputs, but instead players could take their time between each jump calculating their next step as to not fling themselves into a spiky deck. Neither of these types of minigames are inherently harder than the other, but they're pretty different. If you're quick at learning complicated inputs, you might have an advantage in X-Pro style maps, but if you excel at tight platforming, spike levels may be for you. But even if they aren't objectively comparable, most players still agree that at this time, no spike level really came close to Forgotten Veil. Vale. And while this is largely because it took months to build and playtest, there was another important factor, a lack of saving. Now I don't mean level saving, by this point it had been available for years. No, I mean progress saving. If you're playing someone else's level and you leave for any reason, your progress will be completely reset. 
If the level owner is kind, they can manually bring you back to where you left off, but if a world had been released for a while, this just becomes less and less likely. As such, no one really made hard maps, because many players didn't want to sink hours in the level and lose their progress if they had to leave. After a couple more years, the campaign system was added to the game. This allowed the staff to feature well-made levels that could be completed for various rewards. Each campaign would consist of approximately 5 levels with a unifying theme with about the same difficulty. The feature was launched with 6 campaigns already made, the hardest of which being called Fractured Fingers. Unifying theme? Every single level was made in the X-Pro style, with the final tier being X-Pro Forgotten Veil. Vale. The campaign system also had one important feature to make it more accessible to all players. Remember how I said that disconnecting from a level resets your progress? For these new campaign levels, your progress would be saved for 5 minutes upon disconnecting. With this feature and the incentive of prizes, a whole new wave of players tried their hand at beating these difficult levels. At this point, however, most of the difficult levels in Everybody Edits were made with this X-Pro style and for good reason. The spikes that I mentioned earlier were limited. Players couldn't place infinite spikes in their level, but instead they had to buy them from the shop, 10 at a time. But in 2014, a bug was discovered. By spamming coins to lag the level, the game would skip the check to see if the player has placed all their spikes. In December of 2015, a player took advantage of this bug to use spikes to their full extent, pushing the boundaries of what was possible for players to complete. You might recognize it from my last video. Welcome to Endless Pain. This level has 27,834 spikes. 70% of the level kills you on contact. Each minigame has extremely precise platforming, and the tiniest mistake will send the player back to the start, incrementing their death counter by 1. And instead of having 16 minigames like the X-Pro minigames of the past, it had around 80. As players trudged through the level, they had to learn a whole new way of playing minigames. The individual jumps had virtually no leeway. These minigames were not about endurance, they were about precision. And as the player got deeper in the level, the minigames became more and more precise, culminating in the ultimate challenge. Being the second to last challenge in the level, this minigame was all about precision. No arrows, no gimmicks, players are just given an effect that gives them increased speed and have to jump from block to block until they reach the end of the minigame. But how precise is each jump? And that's just the first jump. Needless to say, this minigame made some users go insane. But some players persevered, and Endless Pain did start to see a few winners. The Winked, VLHX, and Orange Cricks being the first three, with their names being added to the win list. See those numbers next to their names? That's their death count. That's how many times they hit a spike, how many times they had to start a minigame from the beginning. But even after thousands of deaths, they each grabbed the trophy at the end of the level. These were the new best players of everybody edits, and they had the silver crown to prove it. The achievements of these players cannot be understated. Each of them had to beat this hellish level in one session because it wasn't in any campaign. And why would it be? The Fractured Fingers campaign, while extremely difficult, was reasonable to beat with enough effort, and hundreds of players managed to beat the campaign after it was launched. But Endless Pain was on another level. So many precise jumps, so many ridiculous gimmicks, no staff team in their right minds would ever add it to any- On November 6th, 2016, the Perpetual Frustration campaign was added, featuring the hardest spike levels in everybody edits. And Endless Pain wasn't even the final tier. This world is the first example of a new style of level, the Helix, and it just takes a few simple steps to build. Step 1. Copy an existing world in its entirety. For this world, the creators chose Desolate Relics, an X-Pro style level released a few months prior. Step 2. Replace every air block with spikes. Every. Single. One. At this point, the staff removed the limits on the amount of spikes world builders could place, so no glitches were required to do this. And finally, step 3, carve out a path to the trophy and make it brutal. But just how hard was this level?
Well, let's take a look at one of the final challenges. This is the ledge minigame. In the original Desolate Relics, to get past this part, you just need to do this. But this is Desolate Helix, so why not add some spikes? To climb this tower, the player has to land on the edge of the block. Too far out and they hit a spike, too far in and they roll right off. This gives the player about 6 pixels of space that they can stand on, and they have to do this 11 times in a row. But despite the difficulty, two users still attempted to beat the level. Both having beaten Endless Pain a few months prior, they grinded, and thousands of deaths later, Orange Crix and Thwink were the first winners of Desolate Helix. Almost immediately after their victory, the level was heavily nerfed. Many of the minigames were completely altered to be made easier, and the entire level was split in half. The campaign was still an ultimate test of skill and perseverance, but future winners only had to put forward a fraction of the effort Orange Crix and Thwink gave. Let's take a moment to talk about these users. Earlier, I showed that they took about 5,000 deaths on their first playthrough of Endless Pain. At the time, there were no other users to compare this number to, but after the release of the Perpetual Frustration campaign, there was a whole new wave of players who suffered through this level. So how far ahead were the original winners from their new competition? Here's a line that shows various Endless Pain winners and their death counts. On the right of each point is their username, and on the left is how many deaths it took them. It's worth noting that this isn't a full list, just all the data I could find. On the top, we have Sticksam, a user who despite having terrible hardware to play the game on, kept playing Endless Pain for months on end, finally ending with over 150,000 deaths. I'd also like to note that a high death count doesn't mean a user is bad by any means. Any user who manages to beat this level has proved that they are incredibly skilled at the game. As we keep going down, the death counts continue to decrease, and eventually, we see Orange Cricks, with nearly 20% fewer deaths in second place. Part of the reason these users were able to put so much time into this level was because of the campaign system I mentioned earlier. As time went on, the staff team began to increase the amount of time your progress would save on Disconnect, from 5 minutes to 15 minutes, and eventually to 24 hours. This made these hard campaigns more accessible for players, as they could now turn their computer off overnight and continue the levels in the morning. But there was one problem with this new system, and to understand it, we must first understand how the system works. A player can only have progress saved in one level at a time, and if they leave the level, their progress will save for 24 hours. As such, if a player joins a different campaign level, their progress will start to be saved there instead, and the original save will be overwritten. Additionally, progress can only be saved in a campaign level that the player has not beaten yet. Now, what happens if a player gets softlocked in a new campaign and has beaten every other campaign in the game? They would either have to wait the full 24 hours, or hope a staff member quickly shows up to fix the problem. The clear solution to this problem would be to add a command to let players reset their progress, but this would take a few days to code. Until then, the staff had a different idea in mind. Why not add a new campaign to the game with one tier and no rewards so people could use it to reset their progress? For this to work, however, they would need to choose a level that was so ridiculous, so insanely difficult and tedious, that no one in their right minds would ever attempt to beat it. And thus, the Be Gone campaign was added. This campaign had one tier, also titled Be Gone, created by Kira Ninja and Lictor. This level had one simple gimmick. Remember those speed control jumps from Are You A God? As the years passed, users began to have a name for these jumps. T-jumps. And this level was filled with them. Every single minigame in Be Gone used T-jumps. This level was made as a complete joke, a challenge that no user was meant to beat. But technically nothing in here was impossible. And since it was added to a secret campaign, if someone really wanted to try to beat it, their progress would be saved. But who would be crazy enough to attempt this level? Orange Cricks and Thwinked both tried, but after getting a few minigames in, they realized just how much time it would take them. No, it would take someone far more dedicated, someone who truly enjoys playing levels that no one is ever meant to beat. The type of user to go back and replay endless pain over and over, just for fun. This is Ale Smile. It's hard to convey just how difficult this level is. Every jump you see has only a fraction of a second of leeway for players to not bonk the ceiling. Between almost every jump, 
the player has to carefully adjust their speed to perfectly align themselves on the next platform. The gameplay on the screen right now may look elegant, but that's just because it's clips of the successful attempts spliced together, and you can see the death count wildly fluctuate. Most of the time, gameplay will look like this. But Alesmile embraced the challenge and inched through the level. While most users were playing new, easy campaigns that were being added, Alesmile was grinding, and eventually, 34,772 deaths later, he grabbed the trophy at the end of the level. He was the sole winner of the hardest level ever beaten, and no one else dared to try. Alesmile was truly on top. Let's take a moment to stop talking about the players of these levels, and focus on who's building them. Earlier, I mentioned a user called Master1, a veteran world builder in the community who also managed to beat Forgotten Vale when it was released. He created all kinds of levels, from puzzle levels to music worlds to video game remakes, but eventually, he got tired of putting quality work into his levels. He began work on a new level with minimalistic art in difficult, uninspired minigames, and it was simply titled Bad EE Level. This level wasn't exceptionally difficult, but still much harder than most of the levels Master One had made prior. Nonetheless, he didn't really expect anyone to actually complete it, but shortly after its release, Orange Crix, Thwink, and Ale Smile each attempted and completed the level. So he began work on another level, Bad EE Level 2, and once again, the three of them beat the level. Soon after came Bad EE Level 3, and though it took years for there to be a winner, at the time of the release, Ill Smile, Orange Crix, and Thwink managed to make it over halfway through the level. At this point, Master One came to a realization. It didn't matter how garbage his levels were, how difficult he made the minigames, as long as they were visually appealing and at least looked humanly possible, he would get to watch Ill Smile, Orange Crix, and Thwink suffer through each minigame. And if there was one thing Master One enjoyed, it was watching them suffer. Around this time, he created a different level series, titled Complete the Monument, or CTM for short. These levels were all about endurance. Instead of requiring a short burst of extreme precision to beat a minigame, the player had to navigate spike-filled terrain, hit a switch, then head all the way back to where they started, without dying. None of the jumps were particularly precise, but to do this many jumps without messing up a single time was an extremely challenging feat of consistency. And just like his bad EE level series, people actually played his CTM maps. Whenever someone beat one of the levels, he made the next one harder. And whenever someone got stuck, he made the next one harder. He didn't want his levels to be beaten. To him, the ideal situation would be for someone to get to the end of the level and then get stuck forever. He even added an incentive to play, offering in-game currency to the winner despite knowing that nobody would ever beat the last few minigames. He was completely sadistic, and fed off of the suffering of the top players. Did I mention that he was one of the staff in charge of creating campaigns? In August of 2018, the staff team were looking to add a new extreme campaign titled Trial and Terror to the game. The theme was levels filled with spike minigames, but unlike Perpetual Frustration, every single level had to have high levels of quality and polish. But Master One wouldn't stand for that, so in the staff chat, he said, Dude Kirby, we need to add FH as tier 6. To which I replied, hell no. Did you mean, hell yes? No. Did you mean, yes? So, after days of arguing, a compromise was proposed. We would release this new extreme campaign without his suggestion, so the players could actually have fun. But at the same time, we would add 4 tiers to the Hidden Be Gone campaign. A new difficulty was added to warn the players of what lay ahead, and Master One was given full power to choose whatever garbage he pleased. And finally, the campaign was given a more fitting name. The Worst Campaign. The race was on, Orange Crix vs Ale Smile. Who would beat the campaign first? Even though Ale Smile had already completed Be Gone, he was out of town when the Worst Campaign was released, giving Orange Crix time to complete Be Gone and start the second tier. So what was this FH map? Well, you may remember Forgotten Veil. Vale. Now, take that level, and add spikes. In comparison to the other levels in this campaign, this level was actually not all that difficult. In fact, it was far easier than Be Gone. 
The only reason it was set to the second tier instead of the first was because of how the campaign system works. In a campaign, the levels must be played in order. Since Worst was built on an existing campaign, if Be Gone was set to anything except the first tier, anyone who beat it prior would have their progress reset, and we just couldn't do that to Ale Smile. So, a few thousand deaths later, Orange Cricks grabbed the trophy and unlocked the third tier. Bad EE level 8 by Master 1. But at this point, Orange Cricks went on hiatus, giving Ale Smile time to catch up. Like tier 2, this level was also easier than Be Gone, but that's not to say it was without its challenges. Like this minigame, the only RNG minigame in all of Worst. Not only is it difficult to squeeze through the spikes, but it's only possible about 6% of the time. 14,000 deaths later, Ale Smile beat the level and unlocked the fourth tier. Here's the thing. After beating Be Gone, there was no doubt that Ale Smile would be able to beat Forgotten Helix or Bad EE level 8. The difficulty of those levels pale in comparison to Be Gone, so Ale Smile just needed to put in a few days of effort and he could progress through the campaign. At this point, Ale Smile only had two tiers to go, but he had been through hell, so how hard could they be? So, after grabbing the trophy at the end of Bad EE level 8, he moved on to the next tier, and upon spawning in the level, he saw two words in big red text, two words that would sum up the challenges that await him. Everybody Edits is a game with a pretty wide skill gap. If you're new to the game, levels like Rainbow Road Raid would take you hours on end to beat, but eventually you'd win, and you'd improve. You'd keep pushing yourself like the players have talked about thus far, mastering Forgotten Veil, vale, grinding through endless pain, and even suffering be gone. But for every single level I've talked about thus far, the question was always, how long would it take to beat this level? They all required complete mastery of the game's mechanics, but could pretty clearly be done with enough dedication. But for Infinity Pain, it was different. It wasn't a question of how long it would take anymore, but instead, could this level be beaten? Keep in mind that this is a sandbox game. Anyone can build whatever garbage they want in their world, so seemingly impossible levels were created all the time, but no one would ever give them a second glance. But now, Ale Smile was face to face with one. No one knew if this level was humanly possible, but he had come all this way. Only one way to find out. Minigame 22. The player gets the low gravity effect at this point, making them fall more slowly, but that doesn't make this minigame easy. To compensate, every turn requires intense precision, forcing the player to come within pixels of each spike. For this dot section, you can't just bounce over the spikes. You have to tap down, then immediately hold up to get as much height as possible, then perfectly catch yourself on the next dots. Then, if you can manage to do all of that, you have to do this. Minigame 28. The player now has the levitation effect. Every time they tap the spacebar, instead of jumping, they levitate. In this minigame, the player has to go from this checkpoint up to this one. But how? These spikes are clearly closed off, and there are no gaps between them. These are called corners, and to understand them, we need to understand exactly how spikes work. Everybody edits runs at 100 ticks per second, meaning that every 1 100th of a second, the game will perform various checks. One of these checks tells the game what type of block the player is interacting with, whether that be an arrow, an effect, or a spike. To do this, it checks what the center of the smiley is interacting with for this specific pixel. If this pixel is colliding with a spike, the player will die. If we zoom in on this minigame and draw the hitboxes, it still may seem impossible to complete, but here's the catch. For a player to actually take a death, their center only has to touch the spike on one of these hundredth of a second intervals. What happens if the center skips over the spikes between this time? If we watch this in slow motion, we can see that the smiley seemingly skips over the spike hitbox, and since the game doesn't think that the player touched the spike, they are able to pass. But this is incredibly precise, and typically requires players throwing away attempts until they finally get passed. But sure enough, Little Smile did. Minigame 41. The player has the levitation effect again, and simply has to get to this bottom checkpoint. But the last minigame that I showed had these ridiculous corners, but this one is just a straight path to the spike. 
This should be easy, right? Well, if we compare these minigames side by side, we can notice a key difference in their path. While the corner minigame mostly had vertical tunnels, this minigame has horizontal ones. What makes this so much harder? We can answer this with a quick test. Both of these smileys have started falling at the same time. After 1 20th of a second, the one on the left will start holding space, and 1 20th of a second after that, the one on the right will start holding space. Despite this extremely brief difference in timing, we can see a pretty intense height discrepancy, one that could be the difference between life and death with tunnels this narrow. And to show just how fast these timings are, here is the same experiment, but in real time. Completing a minigame like this requires complete mastery of the levitation effect, impeccable timing, and patience. Minigame 48. Remember the speed effect minigame at the end of Endless Pain? Let's make it harder. For this jump, when the player hits this wall, they have a 50th of a second to turn around, but it doesn't end there. The final jump of the minigame is tick perfect. 1 100th of a second. If they mess up, they have to redo the entire minigame. Minigame 59. Another deceptively simple one. No levitation to deal with, no crazy jumps, just bouncing through arrow tunnels. But this minigame is precise. Simply calling it pixel perfect would not be accurate. Let's talk about subpixels. Consider this minigame. All the player has to do is touch the crown, but there are a couple left arrows in the way. The obvious solution is just to go as far left as possible and run at the arrows with as much speed as you can build up, but this doesn't work. We can slow this down though and use what we learned about corners to understand this. If we look at where our smiley is on each individual tick, we can see that we first enter the left arrow on the far left side. What happens then if we start the minigame a bit to the right? Now, when we finally enter the left arrows, we will be further in, and this tiny change in the starting position, or subpixel, is enough for us to reach the crown. Back to Infinity Paint. On this bend right here, the player can very slightly control their height. That means that if they get a bad subpixel, the rest of the minigame becomes impossible. If we replace these two up arrows with corners, it would not change the minigame at all. That's how hard it is. Minigame 70. This minigame features two main effects, Infinite Jump and Gravity. Both have pretty self-explanatory purposes. Infinite Jump grants the player infinite jumps, allowing them to jump in the air, and the Gravity effect changes the direction of gravity. It's pretty clear why this minigame is so hard, but this is the nerfed version. When Alesmile first reached the minigame, all of these highlighted areas used to have spikes. This goes to show how uncertain we were that this level was beatable. There were many minigames in this world that Ailsmile sunk hours into, only for us to realize that they weren't humanly possible. Eventually, we removed the spikes, and he continued onwards. Minigame 80. Remember corners? As Alesmile beats Minigame 90, he is greeted with this message. Alright, are you ready? Oh, I guess. <laughs> read it, whatever. <laughs> you just read it. <laughs> I've suffered for so many years. I went through despair, desolation, and hatred. Empty. Destroyed. I'm doing the wrong decision. I know it. It's time. Feel all the hate I've received. Be gone. Oh.
64,661 deaths later, Ill Smile grabbed the trophy. Almost six months after beating Bad EE Level 8, he had finally conquered Infinity Pain. Now, only one level stood between him and being the first winner of the worst campaign. Octo's Fun Castle is a level created by Pingo Hits. It wasn't really intended to be played. When Pingo was bored, he'd often come into this level and build difficult challenges, kind of like making doodles in a notebook. When I asked him for permission to use it in the worst campaign, we went through and cleaned it up a bit. Soft locks were fixed, the quality was improved, and many minigames were nerfed. Although it was still a ridiculous level, it was now definitely easier than Infinity Pain, and Ale Smile was determined to beat it. He logged on for hours every day, and slowly made progress through the level, and as he neared the end, a small crowd of spectators gathered. Finally, on March 23rd, 2018, over 7 months after the worst campaign released, he grabbed the trophy. Earlier, I mentioned that this campaign did not have a prize, and that's what Alesmile thought when he was playing it, but we secretly added one. On each player profile, there was a list of badges that show the campaigns they have beaten, so for the worst campaign, we designed the best badge. Isn't it beautiful? After the completion of the worst campaign, there weren't any new extreme campaigns being added to the game. We knew that it was only a matter of time until everybody edits was going to be shut down, and considering worst took 7 months to complete, it wouldn't make sense to release a new campaign and not give players adequate time to complete it. Nonetheless, players kept playing and creating insane levels. Orange Crix actually came back and completed the worst campaign for himself, Master 1 continued making bad EE levels and CTMs, Pingo Hits worked on more Octo Worlds, and Kira Ninja made more spike maps. Some new builders even tried their hand at making these spike maps, such as Yoshi Logan's The End Is Nigh Remix, and Boring Minigame by the almighty Chirojawig, may we all bow in his greatness. Download links are in the description if you want to try any of these yourself, along with some other levels that I didn't mention in this video, such as T-Land and Octoridge by Lictor. Were any of these levels harder than Infinity Pain? Well, probably. Once you get to a certain level of difficulty, it's kinda hard to tell. Sure, you can make a level with tick-perfect jumps and pixel-perfect movement, but at some point you begin to approach a line the line that separates the possible from the theoretical. Eventually, if the minigame is hard enough, it's just no longer feasible. I could list off minigames from unbeaten spike levels and explain why they fit in the theoretical category, but I can never really be sure. This line is far from objective, and has drastically changed over the years. If you showed endless pain to players back in 2010, they'd likely all agree that it was humanly impossible. Show be gone to players from 2012, and they would come to the same conclusion. Who's to say that this line won't keep shifting in the future? That in a few years, some new player will beat a new level that makes Infinity Pain look like child's play? There's one more level I'd like to show. On New Year's Eve 2010, everybody edits was shut down, and players who wished to continue to play the game could download an offline client to create maps. With this new client, Master1 created what very well may be his hardest level to date, bad EE offline level. See, since everybody edits now use an offline client, it could be modded, and Master1 had access to the task client, which let him create save states and play the game one tick at a time. With this tool, he could create more precise minigames than ever before and actually ensure that they were technically possible. Like this minigame, where the player has to grab the up arrows at the perfect subpixel or else it simply will not work, or this minigame, where nearly every jump is tick perfect. And it all culminates here, the final challenge. It has everything, tight platforming, insane jumps, and a painful lack of checkpoints. As of now, this level does not seem possible for a human to beat, but we said that about the worst campaign. And like every level for the past 11 years that has claimed the title of being the hardest, it just takes one determined player to push themselves and raise the skill ceiling. Thanks for watching.